justice cried with frowning face. This mountain is no hiding place. Then a great heavenly voice I heard, and mercy's angel form appeared. She led me on with pallid face to Jesus.
justice cried with frowning face This mountain is no hiding place Then a great heavenly voice I heard And mercy's angel form appeared She led me on with pallid face To Jesus as my hiding place Jesus, Jesus, calm the storm Tell me I'll be safe from harm Resting in your arms, Jesus Father, Son, and 
It is on? Okay. Uh, welcome to Second City Church this morning. I want to welcome you if you're uh, visiting with us through a screen, if you're worshiping with us, if you're part of this church, if you're just kind of checking us out, and if you're here this morning and this is your first time, I want to welcome you. I'm glad uh, some of us have gathered together. I know I heard from a couple of families yesterday with the uptick in COVID cases that they won't be with us here, but they'll be with us there. And yet it's still good to have some of us gather together, together and uh, worship our Lord. I do want to uh, tell you that I know this is strange. We're all, now we're wearing masks up here. Uh, we're trying to honor the authorities that God has put over us and follow their guidelines. And so if you come and you don't have a mask, it's okay if you come, but then you got to put it on. <laughs> like we've got tons of masks here, lots, like hundreds in the office. So if everybody shows up with that one, we can provide for everybody. Um, but we want to follow those guidelines and honor our authorities as we're able. I'll admit that's sort of strange for me. We have a baptism today, which is just a wonderful gift. And I've never preached in a mask, but hopefully uh, the Lord gives hearing, actually, right? It's not just us. I mean, he's the one who gives us ears to hear. So hopefully he will do that as, uh, as we gather together. Um, he promises that he's with us, and so that's our, that's our great hope. Um, I hope you were also able to read my letter that was sent out in the newsletter. Uh, Carl Aronson, who's been a part of our church these last five years, he died on Wednesday. And... Um, he struggled for a long time with health and with addiction and stuff and came to us through the mission and was a real part of our community. And, um, and we're going to uh, miss his presence among us. And so we gather together uh, in some ways just fittingly in our time, sort of weary and heavy laden, and yet with the joy that our Lord is present with us, that he puts his mark upon us, that he loves us, that he dies for us, that he brings us to himself. And so we, we carry those two truths together our whole lives, right? We do. This is our life in this, in this world, these two truths of the brokenness of the world and the beauty of the gospel. And so we enter into worship with those things in mind. And I would invite you now to stand, if you're able. If you're watching, please stand also. Participate as you're able. 
Actually, I was going to say this too. One thing we're not doing for y'all who are watching online, you can see that we don't have like the words at the bottom of the screen. Our bulletin is on our website, secondcitychurch.org. Please get on there. Just pop it up. It's super easy. Melissa and I did this last week. It was super easy to follow along on our phone. Do it that way, please. And now let's call one another to worship using Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And And in in his his word, word, I I hope. hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More More than than watchmen for the morning. morning. More More than than watchmen watchmen for the morning. morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with with the the Lord Lord, there is steadfast love, and and with him is plentiful redemption. redemption. And he will redeem Israel from from all all his his iniquities. iniquities. Let's sing together in the Lord, I'll be ever thankful. And so we follow that pattern, but we do so knowing that because the Lord is near, he is also the Lord who is gracious. He draws near to people. He draws near to sinners, and he loves to do so. And so we come to the Lord confessing our sins and doing so with confidence that he is the God who forgives us our sins. Hear this. This is from Daniel chapter 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. For we've rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Let's confess now, first singing the Trisagion, and then we'll have a time of silence and we'll confess together. We'll be singing this through twice. confess together now. Oh my God, God, incline incline your your ear and hear. Open your your eyes and see our desolations 
and, and the, the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Brothers and sisters, hear this. This is good news for you. If you go to the Lord confessing your sins, he does not turn you away. He doesn't. He never does that in the scriptures. So if you've done that this morning, listen to this. This is from Psalm 103. This is beautiful. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Brothers and sisters, those words are for you this morning. His grace is new every morning. And so, listen to this. In Jesus Christ, our sins, your sins, my sins, are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God indeed. You may be seated, and I'm going to invite up the Weebers. I'm looking. Which bulletin did I put my paper in? Here it is. Um, this is such a, a joyful thing. This is our second baptism since COVID. Um, the first one was this summer with Sarah Furch was baptized, and there was just a gift in that. Uh, somebody saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus, and I want to follow Jesus. And there was a sense in which oh, our community, though we're dispersed, has, in a sense is still growing. And that is a gift. Um, I feel like there's some particular gifts in this baptism today, and they're also sort of related to the strange time that we live in. Um, this year has been one of unrest, uh, one of racial unrest. And one of the things that we believe as Christians is that the waters of baptism are thicker than blood. That you are, if you are united to Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, you are brothers and sisters with everybody else who does. The family that she's entering into is a global, the, it's the most diverse group of people the world has ever known and will ever know. And those are her brothers and sisters. If we want reconciliation, what we need it in is Jesus, the great reconciler. That's something that we see in baptism. Another thing that I thought was just particularly beautiful as I was thinking about this this week is what our Lord tells us is that all things must work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. And that in the strangeness of our time, when it feels unstable, God's promises are for you. They're for you too, but y'all especially today. And you, you need to hear this. In the unrest of the life around us, in the strangeness of parenting, I mean, you know, congratulations, you've got somebody a year old. It feels like an accomplishment, doesn't it? It really does. But it's so comforting to know that our Lord is saying, she's mine. And that she belongs to all these people here. And these people that are watching, they're saying, this child belongs to us. You're not in it alone. God will take you through it. He'll take us through this time of unrest. He will. He does. He will protect us. He does this with his people all the time. And his promise is for her also. And that's partly what we're seeing in the waters of baptism being poured on her, that she belongs to Jesus. That's a great comfort. In fact, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, it's our only comfort in life and death that we belong to Jesus. That's our only comfort. Um, so with that in mind, Weavers, I have a few questions for you. Do you acknowledge Logan's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do. do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? We do. do you now unreservedly dedicate Logan to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example? that you will pray with and for her, that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
All right, congregation, I have a couple questions for you. Would you stand? Do you receive Logan as your family in Christ? And do you promise to give the gifts God has given to all of you to encourage her as she follows Jesus? Do you? Wonderful. Yeah, that was a we do. Y'all did, y'all did a good job. We, I should have led you in that better. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Logan now before you in your care? Will you? We will. Wonderful. Now, there's printed for you in your bulletin an affirmation, and I'd like for us to say this together. It's on page six. If you're uh, watching, please say this along with us. We will surround surround Logan Logan with with a community of of love and forgiveness forgiveness, that she may grow in her trust of God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Before I baptize Logan, I want us to say the Nicene Creed together. This is the faith that Logan is being brought into, the faith of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so using the Nicene Creed, let me get you one quickly. Let's confess our faith together. We believe believe in in one God, God, the the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of of heaven and earth, earth, of all it is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, He became became incarnate incarnate from the Virgin Virgin Mary and and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm going to use this for a second. Hey, sweetie. Just taking it all in. You'll be taking it all in your whole life. Logan, Adelaide, Weber, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For you, little one, the Spirit of God moved over the waters of creation. All right, I'll just hold you. And the Lord God made a covenant with his people. For you, Jesus Christ came into the world and lived and showed God's love. For you, He suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at last, it is finished. (laughs) Let me, let's sing to you. We'll do that. Maybe that'll calm her down. Let's sing to her. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give Gracious to you, the Lord. 
turn his face toward you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever. Let's pray together. Our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bless you and praise you for Logan. God, we are so grateful for her life. God, we ask your blessing upon her that the name of Jesus would always be sweet to her, that she would always find in you her life, her joy, her peace, her rest. God, we pray for her parents, Jason and Livy. Lord, thank you for them. Thank you for their love for her. God, we do pray that you would equip them as they train her in your ways. We equip them with grace, with wisdom, with stamina. Help them to know that you are with them always, that we, your people, are with them, that they do not walk this road alone. God, we pray that we would indeed, as we have confessed, surround her with a community of love, that she would grow in the knowledge and love of you all of her days. This we ask in the precious and powerful name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to pass the peace of Christ, but we're doing this a little bit different. What I would love to do is have you come up and give her a hug and kiss and all this, but we're not going to do that today. In fact, we're not even going to move from our pews. I'd like you to stand up and to those around you, extend the peace of Christ with words. Okay, don't touch each other. Peace the Lord be with you. That was a gift, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, I think I put my bulletin right here too. getting out of peace that easy. continue our worship. Go ahead and turn that page to Great is Thy Faithfulness. This is mostly going to be familiar for you, but there's a new part. Get ready to shout it out. (laughs) 
Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. We're going right to verse 2.
Great singing. You really want to belt that one out without masks, don't you? Mine was leaping off my own face, led by the Holy Spirit, I think, maybe, as long as that's not heresy. Uh, the next one is here in the bulletin on page 8. Sing to the Lord of Harvest. singing. You may be seated. Again, I want to welcome you to Second City Church. Wait, I'm not on. I'm on now. I want to welcome you again, uh, whether you're here in person or watching online. Um, I will say this just quickly again. Uh, what we have sought to do from the beginning of all of the kind of shutdowns and whatnot is follow the guidelines of our governing authorities as much as we are able, while also being open as much as we are able. Um, so that's why we are saying, you must wear a mask when you come to worship now. You must. I mean, before it was like, we would like you to, please. Um, and uh, they're saying, even with social distancing, you must do that inside now, right now. So we're following that. And I will say this too, we, everything is getting washed Saturday. Okay, everything is getting washed down Saturday. Um, so we're trying to make it as uh, clean and hospital as we can here. And we also uh, are trying, we're seeking for those of you who are watching to make this as accessible as possible. There have been hours and hours put in to figuring out how to do video well and make this as engaging as possible for those who are watching. We hope that's the case. We understand that there are many reasons why people don't come on Sunday mornings and we want you to enter in still as you are able as much as we possibly can. 
because of numbers going up and whatnot, I do want to say that we are not going to be doing Monday morning breakfasts um, because of the nature of just eating a group of people together. It just means you got to take your masks off and stuff like that. We're not going to be doing Monday morning breakfasts. And uh, most of our uh, small group Bible studies have moved towards, towards more of an online Zoom format. Um, so hopefully you can still engage with one another, but we're trying to do that given the parameters of our times. So um, please enter in as you're able and know that we who are, trying, <laughs> who are leading are trying to do the best we can with all that we have been given. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention those things. Uh, I prayed for Logan earlier. I'd like to pray for the, uh, the other children of our church now. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, uh, we know this is a strange time for parents and for children, and we pray especially now your blessing upon them. As many of them won't be with grandparents this uh, Thanksgiving or maybe this Christmas. We don't know what's going on. And um, they're not going to be with their classmates as much and playing in playgroups as much and all these kinds of things that give them such joy and us delight in watching their joy. Um, God, I pray that you'd be the, with the children of this church, that they would know your love, um, and that they would know your peace, something that passes understanding, that they would walk in your faith, that spirit you would so move in their hearts and their lives that you would give them strength. You are the Lord and giver of life as we confessed. We pray that you would do that in, in the children of this church. Lord, train them up and be with us as we seek to lead them in your ways, in your love, in the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And Lord, we do pray for parents at this time too. We pray for teachers. We pray for all those who are interacting with children, that you would give them stamina, that you would give them grace and wisdom as they do that. Lord, bless them in these ways, we pray, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let's give our attention to the reading of God's word. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. O when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Stand together and sing the glory of Patri. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Here's Daniel chapter 9. You heard uh, the first, actually you heard the first 23 verses a couple weeks ago, but we're going to start in verse 20 again uh, this morning. Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 to 27. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in a swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I've now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, the prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with square and moats and, a, and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. 
desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half a week. Half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until a decreed end is poured out on the desolator. The word of the Lord. Amen. The New Testament reading, Romans 8, 12 through 15. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to living according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Gospel reading. Hear the gospel according to Acts. Glory to you, O Lord. Acts 2, 1 through 6. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and there were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Maybe may be seated. It might seem a little odd to have the Acts passage for our gospel reading, but it, and I'm not going to connect this as much as I would like to, it would take too long, but it's connected to our passage here in an interesting way. Let me pray for us. Lord God, uh, as we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, you're the only one who unstops ears and softens hard hearts and gives sight to blind spiritual sight, and so even with masks on, and maybe a more difficult time understanding, Lord, we know that nothing's impossible for you because you soften hard hearts and you unstop stopped up ears. So God, we pray that we would hear from your word a, a passage that is notoriously difficult and that you would speak to us through it this morning. Meet us where we are in our joy, in our sorrow, in our lament, in our weariness, in our gratitude, in all of these things, Lord, and draw us to yourself, we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Okay, so some of y'all know this. I love maps. Like, love maps. I have framed maps in my house. Um, if you've met with me, uh, most likely, if you've met with me in person, I've normally said, like, oh, where are you from? And then you tell me, and if I don't know it, I'm like, I have to reach for my phone. I just have to. Like, it is, it's one of my um, obsessive compulsive, one of them, like, movements of my body. Like, I have to know where... You existed on the globe and like kind of even what street and stuff like that. I know I'm not the only one that's like this, but I might be the only one in this room. It is an interesting thing. Um, I love maps. I love knowing where I am. I also love knowing how to get from point A to point B and also sort of how long it'll take. I just love this kind of thing. Um, so when I, when I have moved to a new place, which I've done quite a few times in my life, I have literally spent hours just looking at the map of that place. Like, I want to know where I am and where other things are, where people are, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, Dottie Roden, some of you know this, Dottie Roden and I, until this whole COVID thing happened, we, more or less weekly, we would go and visit our elderly shut-in folk. And she quickly was like, Peter, how do you know, like, how to get to Duncannon already or something like that? Or like, this nursing home or that nursing home? I was like... Uh, it's just weird, Dottie. I just love maps, right? I just love knowing how to get from this place to that place. Okay, so, and this was stirred up because of, like, the whole dispute between Uber drivers and taxi drivers in the world's great cities. But a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I learned about the test called The Knowledge. 
Isn't that just a great name for a test, too? The knowledge. Um, the knowledge is a test for the black cabbie drivers in London. Okay, you know there's different taxis in London. You always want to take the black ca cabs, right? Those iconic taxis. Okay, in order to be a taxi driver for one of those taxis in London, you must pass the knowledge. The knowledge. Okay, now, um, here's the thing. If you've been to London, or even if you've just looked at a map of London, you know that those streets are like, wah, 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 and they're like, one way this way. Wait, no, one way that way. And then it's not, it's just not a grid, you know? Bam, 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 bam. Like, you go to New York, you're like, okay, I kind of get it. I'm on 116th East. Easy. London is like, like this, right? It's laid out all, in all kinds of weird ways. So the black cabbies must learn 25,000 streets in London. Really. Um, they have to learn 20,000 points of interest. Naming like schools, museums, train stations, stuff like that, but 20,000 of them. And they have to know how to get from here to there the quickest, okay? So, uh, you, uh, by the way, this is, not, this is not something that's required of Uber drivers or actually other taxis. The, the black cabbie drivers are not allowed to use satellite navigation systems. They have to have it in their head, okay? It's amazing. Okay, so they know where they're going, they know how to get there, they know how long it takes, and the test is sort of like becoming a Presbyterian minister. They study for two to four years, and then there is first a written exam, and then there is an oral exam where they have to answer 320 routes by street names, like left here, left there, right, right there, blah, blah, blah. And, and there's actually a documentary that you can watch. It's unbelievably amazing. Um, okay, so they have to, they have to rattle off 30, 320 routes of tour sites, of train stations, churches, all this kind of stuff. Here's where I'm going with this. I don't know how they make sense of this. Like, I love maps, and still, that, I, like, I hear about that, and I'm like, I don't want to pass the knowledge. That doesn't seem worth it to me to put that time in to learn that. Um, I love studying maps, but that's too much. It's pretty well recognized that the end of Daniel chapter 9 is sort of like the, like the city of London. Okay, it, it is, Okay. Um, the beginning of Daniel 9 is sort of, of, it's sort of straightforward. Daniel confesses the sins of himself and of his people. It's this great prayer of confession. We know what con prayer and confession is. We do it every week here. The end of Daniel chapter 9, no, not so much, okay? Um, quite a few commentators say that you, you always have more questions at the end of reading and studying Daniel chapter 9 as you have answers. There's always more questions than you have answers for I will tell you, that was the case for me studying this, too. I have more questions than I have answers, but some of the answers, I think, are deeply important, okay? Deeply, deeply important. <clears throat> um, so here's what I, how I want to approach Daniel chapter 9, and my hope is that even if you don't kind of know, okay, where all the roads are or what everything is in it, you'll go, I understand what's happening here. That's my goal, okay? I'm going to address this with three questions. The questions are these. What time is it? and I don't mean 949. Who's the person or people, and why does this matter, okay? So first, what time is it? So a couple weeks back, you might remember, there was a guy preaching, Nathaniel Stamper, he's a pastor over in Lancaster County and teaches at Veritas, the classical school over in Lancaster. And he was preaching in the beginning of uh, Daniel chapter nine. He was pre preaching the prayer of confession. And you might remember, I don't know if you remember this, but Daniel chapter 9 begins with saying that it takes place in the first year when Darius was king. Okay, Darius was the Mede. And if you remember back to chapter 5, the Medes and the Persians came in, snuck under the, you know, uh, diverted the river and snuck under and actually took over Babylon. And the year that that happened was 539. Okay, so we know the date of Daniel chapter 9. It's 539. That was when Darius actually was the king over Babylon. We also know that Daniel was a student of the book of Jeremiah. We know this for quite a few reasons. But one thing that's happening here in this chapter is that he's probably reading Daniel, or Jeremiah chapter 25 um, or, Daniel, or Jeremiah chapter 21, or sorry, 29. And Jeremiah says there 
the Babylonian uh, captivity, the rule of the Babylon, Babylonians over the people of Israel is going to be 70 years. That's the allotted time that God's going to allow them. Okay. So you might know this, that like the beginning of the exile, people debate the date. I don't know if you'll remember, but we, th- we, we think that Daniel was probably actually taken away in 611 B.C. or maybe 610 or 69 or 608, something right around there. But he was the f- that was the first wave of Babylonian captivity. Okay, there's other waves, 605, 603. And then everybody pretty much agrees that the final, the, the date that you normally hear about the Babylonian captivity is 586 because that's the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Okay, well, I want you to think about this. Daniel is reading Jeremiah. He's like 70 years. And he might have actually been taken away in 609. And now it's 539. Babylon's no longer in charge. Now it's the Medes and the Persians. He's like 70 years is up. Cool, 70 years at least for me and that, and that kind of my reckoning. And he says, okay, well, what I need to do is confess my sin and confess the sin of my people. Because if we're going to go back to God, we've got to deal with our sin. If we're going to go back to Israel, and if God's going to come back, because his temple is now destroyed, if God's going to set things up right, keep in mind too, I don't know if you heard this, but it's at the, he's praying this at the time of the evening sacrifice. Not that the sacrifice is happening, because it couldn't be happening because the temple was destroyed, but he's still thinking about it. He's saying, I want to be near God. I want to have sin dealt with fully. I want to be restored, and I want my people to be restored right? He's doing the act of confession. He's saying, God, draw us near to yourself. Deal with our sin perfectly. Restore us to what we are meant to be. Restore the world to its right order. And he's hopeful that maybe this is the time. Maybe these 70 years are truly up. Okay, so Daniel's doing this. He's confessing, and Gabriel shows up. Gabriel, the angel, shows up. He says, Daniel, you need to know that you're greatly loved, And then he says, I'm going to give you a vision and I want you to understand it. And this is sort of the gist of it, okay? You thought it was going to be 70 years. Settle in. It's going to be longer. It's going to be 70 weeks. That might not sound longer, but I'll explain it, okay? What you're supposed to be saying is like, what? What's happening? 70 weeks, which he would have been saying 70 weeks of years? God, you're saying it's still going to be 490 years? Okay, now some of this is just sort of confusing for us, right? We hear this and we're like, what is this? 70 weeks, that's supposed to be years. And then it says 62 weeks down in verse 25. And then in verse 27, it takes, talks about a week and a half a week. And all this just feels deeply confusing. Okay. Does anyone find this stuff confusing? Okay. (laughs) Believe me, you are not alone. Like, everybody is sort of confused about this. And if somebody says they understand it all, just, like, say, I don't think I should listen to you. Okay? Um, So let me say this. Like, I don't even even want to pretend to understand, no, I don't want to even pretend that I understand all this stuff, okay? But there are a few things here that are really, really clear, and it has to do with time, all right? There's a couple things here that are not so confusing. Okay, Um, one thing that is not terribly confusing is that there was sort of a return from exile after 70 years. God did make good on the Babylonian allotment of exile only happening 70 years. That was true, right? The Medes and Persians came and took over. And um, it's sort of true that God's people actually did return in various waves. You guys probably know this, maybe some of you do through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and whatnot, in various waves back to the promised land. And those took place in different times. Um, one thing that's also pretty clear, uh, if you know numerology in the Bible, the study of numbers, is that the number seven is the number for completion in the Bible. So when Gabriel says, hey, it's going to be 70 sevens, he's saying, it's going to be complete. This exile is going to be complete, okay? It's completion. Um, so there's, there's a metaphor that's happening here, I guess is what I'm saying too. Right? There's a metaphor of completion. 70 times 7, G, uh, Gabriel is saying, 
Daniel, this exile is going to be done. The exile, the return to God that you long for. Your sins to truly be dealt with. It's going to be done. It'll happen. It'll happen perfectly and completely. Um, but I will say this. It's not totally just metaphor, right? It's not totally metaphor. Um, so some of you might know that uh, Cyrus made a decree in the, actually the very next year after this chapter in 538. This is the beginning of the book of Ezra. That some of the people were allowed to go back and resettle the promised land. Um, worship had been cut off. The temple had been destroyed. Um, and so they go back, and initially there's no worship taking place, right? There's still, it seems as though, it would appear as though they are still estranged from God in terms of their sin, right? They're still distant from God, from their sin. But then, you might remember this too, this is also in Ezra, in Ezra chapter 7. In the, in the year 458 BC, Artaxerxes gives a decree to Ezra to bring back the priests and the Levites, specifically. He says, go back and establish worship. Go back and start offering the sacrifices, all these kinds of things. He says, reestablish relationship with God. And then you probably know the sort of the, the dynamic of rebuilding the temple and stuff at that time. <clears throat> Here's part of what happens. They long for the temple to be rebuilt, for right relationship with God to be restored, for atonement to be made, for sacrifices to be offered, and for God to be present. For God to be there. Because that is what they were made for. They were made for right relationship with one another and right relationship with God. That's what creation says. That's the whole story. Is that is what people are made for. And it's been estranged. They were told that he would descend again as he did long ago at Sinai and at the dedication of the temple under Solomon. And that is what they longed for, okay? So time and metaphor, this is what I'm saying. There's actually a metaphor happening. And there's also a temporal dynamic that's taking place. Something is going to be completed. There's times, there's weeks, there's years, and there's 490 years, okay? That's the time frame here that's clear. A lot can be said about this passage, I guess, but here's what I'm sort of trying to distill for you in terms of time. This passage is talking about confession, about completion, and about this exile taking a whole lot longer than the Israelites wanted. 70 years was one thing. Tag on another 490. Okay? Okay, so before I move on to the next question, I want you to kind of sit with this just a little bit. So, you're in exile, which is to say, you are not in your home. Right? You're not at home. You wonder where God is. You wonder if he's just given up entirely on this whole story of redemption and you being a part of it. Um, your home was destroyed. Um, you have struggled to live life in exile. Um, sometimes, think about this, we've talked about this in Daniel, but you have struggled with giving in to the assimilation of the people around you that just said, be like us, eat the king's food, become a Babylonian. It's great. You've struggled with that. And you've struggled with the other dynamic on the other side of just sort of fortification against the, the, those other people, just sort of completely retreating from them, right? You've been sitting in this, you've been sitting in it for seven, 70 years. And now, as the end seems to be in sight, you're being told 70 times seven. Weariness, right? And God, what are you doing? What are you saying? You're probably wanting to say this Daniel's a false prophet. But then you remember wait, he was the one who was faithful in prayer even to death. He was the one that didn't eat the king's food. He's the one who has been established, I mean, not just from like, you know, he's the politician who doesn't just make it from like Trump's cabinet to Biden's cabinet. He goes from like Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar to Darius. To, you're like, how does this guy do this? That's impossible. We don't know any example like this. Daniel seems to be this faithful prophet of faithful prophets, but he's got a message for the people that is imp incredibly hard to hear. What time is it? And he says, time to settle in. Time to take the long road. 
Okay, my next question, who's the person? Or maybe it's people. Um, so some people say that if you understand Daniel chapter 9, I read this, that if you, uh, Daniel chapter 9 is like a test for whether or not somebody can really understand prophecy. So if people don't understand Daniel chapter 9, don't trust that they can understand Bible prophecy. I think that's a little crazy. Um, some people think that these verses are unlocking the great mysteries of the end times and the Antichrist and things like that. Um, I tend to think, again, that this is sort of uh, verses that are more like a really hard map. They're hard to learn. Maybe you can kind of learn them somewhat, but it's uh, no easy thing to do. Um, there are some verses here, this is what I'm suggesting to you, that sort of do feel like a little bit of a grid, like they're numbered or they're lettered. But I think a lot of this actually feels a little bit more like the town that I lived in in the south of France that was founded in 123 B.C. And the roads made no sense. They're not, they made no sense. And the numbers was, were all off too. You're like, how does anybody live here? And like, get from point A to point B. That's kind of what it feels like to me. So who's the person who are the people? Well, I want to suggest to you here that there are some, there's one person here that it feels more like grid. It's clear. The other people are more like the, the streets that go all over the place, okay? So first, the, the thing that goes all over the place. This is verse 27. This is a notoriously difficult verse. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to the sacrifice and the offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. I don't really know who he's talking about. Um, in fact, the, the, the man who was president of Covenant Seminary when I was there, Brian Chappell, some of y'all might know who he is, he wrote a couple of books on Daniel, and he's like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> Here's a few options. Okay, I think the best options are um, that it might be talking about Jesus partially here, and it, it's probably talking also about Titus, the one who destroys the temple in AD 70. I'm not going to go into it all why. I just want to say this, that like, there's some confusing stuff here, and there's talking about some history stuff, and it's just challenging. It feels like an old southern French town. And here's why I feel confident saying that. Because the Bible is incredibly opaque at times, but it is absolutely clear at other times. And this passage is absolutely clear in the most important way. And that is that this passage in the, in the beginning is talking about one person very clearly. Okay, one person very clearly. Listen to this. This is verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint... The most holy says place, but actually it's the same word for one, to anoint a holy one. What Daniel's longing for is atonement, right? He's just made this long confession of sin. What he's longing for is to know that his confession is accepted before God. What Daniel's longing for is for his sins and the sins of his people to be dealt with totally. What he wants to know is we're okay. We can be with God again. We can be with God as we are meant to be. Things will be as they are meant to be. Again, I want you to think back about the people in exile because they were called to be faithful to God in exile. Um, they were called to settle in, right? To build houses, to plant gardens, to be given and taken in marriage. This is Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, to have jobs, uh, to have political jobs like Daniel, to have other kinds of jobs. Um, and my guess is that they were facing so many of the same difficulties that you and I face. Wondering how do we stay faithful without just sort of assimilating, falling into assimilation on one side and falling into just fortification on the other side, right? Just building up walls and saying, we're not even going to touch those stinky Babylonians. In fact, we sort of just wish they would die, Right? Psalm 139, by the, waters of by the waters of Babylon. How do we engage faithfully in this world? And the fact is, I guarantee you, they fell in either ditch all the time. 
right? Because I fall in either ditch all the time, and I bet you do too, and you probably have an inclination you might lean this way or lean that way, like just lean into assimilating, becoming just like everybody around you who doesn't follow Jesus, or saying, oh, I don't want to touch those stinky people, which is not also not like Jesus, right? He touched all the stinky people. We fall in these ditches all the time, and this is actually unfaithfulness to our Lord, falling in these ditches. And this is what they were dealing with, right? They had sinned, and they knew that. They know it just like you and I do when we are honest with ourselves and with God. And they knew that their sin was great, just like ours is, just like mine is and just like yours is. They're falling in these ditches all the time. They are going against the ways of our Lord, and we are too. We are. And what Daniel's saying is something, God, if you're going to restore us to yourself Something has to be done about it. And what this prophecy is saying is there's going to be a time when it's going to be complete, when it's going to be fully done, when your sin won't be counted against you one tiny bit, none. It'll be gone, dealt with completely, fully, completion, 70 times 7, done. Done, done. He says it's going to be the time when iniquity will be atoned for, when an end to sin will be brought in, when everlasting righteousness will be established, and when a most holy one will be anointed, which is to say when the Messiah will come, the anointed one. That's what Messiah means after all. I want to suggest to you that as opaque as some of this passage is, it is clear in this way. This is teaching us about our Lord. This is pointing us to Jesus. Not in some, like, cliche Sunday school answer way. You know, like, what is this talking about, God, the Bible, Jesus? No, this is clearly saying what you are longing for, what you are feeling with the burden of sin and the desire to be made right with God, to have life with him and life with one another, you find in Jesus and only in Jesus. This is Jesus. He's saying return happens when Jesus comes. Jesus brings you back home. He brings you back from exile. He brings you back to God. He is, your lo- he is where you find your longing for sins to be atoned for, for life with God to be reestablished. They understood, well, Daniel understood, that what he longed for was for the Messiah to come, the hoped-for one, who would truly establish God's people in righteousness and holiness because of the work of the Holy One. God alone entering into the world and dealing with sin perfectly. By the way, if it was lost on you, uh, 490 years from the time when when Ezra was let, uh, when Artaxerxes wrote the letter to Ezra to reestablish the temple with the priests and the Levites, 490 years is essentially the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And one of the things that we don't see when the temple is rebuilt after the exiles return, we never see the Shekinah glory, the glory cloud of the Spirit come back on the temple. We never see it. The Spirit covers over the waters of creation. The Spirit covers in the cloud over Sinai. The Spirit hovers in the cloud of the dedication of the temple. And the Spirit finally hovers over Jesus in his baptism. And then again in Acts chapter 2, when the temple is established as Jesus' people. This is pointing us to our Lord. What they long for, they get in Jesus. And it's the same thing that's true of you. What you long for, you get in Jesus. Your sin actually dealt with completely, fully, perfectly. Right relationship with God restored. Here's the thing, though. It was a long time. It's a long time to wait. It's a long time to wait. So finally, here's my third question. I'll just kind of wrap it up with this. Why does this matter? (laughs) Why does it matter? What's it teaching us? Well, first and foremost, it does teach us that our great longings are met in Jesus. They are. Your deepest longing is fulfilled in Christ. All of the things that you're running after, you find your deepest longing in Jesus. 
He's the only way you are made right with God. He's the only way that your sins are atoned for. He's the only way that righteousness is established. His cross and the empty tomb. It's only in Jesus. It is. I know it's my inclination and I know it's yours to find it elsewhere. This passage is saying it's only in Jesus. Only Jesus can cover over all the ways that we throw bombs at our neighbors and wish their death like they did long ago, right? Only Jesus can cover over the ways that we fall into assimilating and say, Jesus, I don't want to follow your ways. Look at all this way over here. He's the only one that can pay the penalty for these sins. He does it. Only Jesus can cover the ways that we deny him. We live lives of unbelief. Only Jesus can make confession for us before the God, before the Father. Plead our case before the mercy seat. There's another really important lesson here, and I feel like it sits in our day maybe important. I mean, it's maybe an important message for our day. And that's that you got to settle in, right? I mean, Daniel, he thought, okay, 70 years is up. That's cool. Let's go back. And Gabriel says, uh, it's going to be a while. And we live in this in-between time, knowing that God worked perfectly in Jesus, but longing for things to be made right. And we know that deeply. We know that the world is not as it's meant to be. And we do not know when our Lord will return. He promises that he will. But he says, walk with me. Walk with me in the long, long obedience of faith. It's not easy. It's not easy. 490 years was a long time. And you know what? However long our Lord calls us to remain faithful this time will feel like a long time. It will. And yet he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make things perfect again. I will be with you perfectly as in Eden. I will do it. Remain faithful to me. So I would actually encourage you, there's a short, short documentary on this test called The Knowledge. It was just made like six years ago. The, the taxi test. And part of it shows how crazy people can go when they're taking this test. Right? 25,000 roads. You got to know like the fastest way from here to there. And people are like just going crazy trying to pass this test. In some ways, I just want to, I want to say this. You feel like you can go crazy like with Daniel chapter 9, but you can just go crazy in life going, Lord, when are you going to work fully? When are you going to bring in the kingdom fully? It feels like you can go crazy with weariness. And the message that you need to hear is Jesus is worth it. He's going to do it. Walk in this way that feels and often is just a long obedience in the same direction because Jesus is totally worth it. Let me pray for us. Lord in heaven, um, God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you want to teach us this morning. Please, Lord. We can feel so weary. I know Daniel and the, those in exile long ago felt so weary. And we long to see you work perfectly. But we look back knowing that you entered this world in Jesus, that the Spirit descended on Jesus perfectly in this world, that he conquered death and rose again from the grave, that we have a sure hope of our promise in him, that he will make all things right, that our sin isn't counted against us one bit because of his work for us, that he loves us perfectly and will bring us home perfectly. We pray this in his powerful and precious name. Amen. And we confessed our faith earlier during the baptism. And we're going to do prayers to the people a little bit differently, partly because so much of our church is watching online. We're not going to, kind of for the time being, we're not going to have as much open, quiet time of prayer. In fact, this morning, we're going to pray together through song. So I'm going to invite you to listen to the part that's not bold in your, in your uh, bulletin and then sing the part that is in bold.
take a moment and pray for our tithes and offerings. Let's pray together. Lord in heaven, uh, our great hope in this life and the next is that we belong to you, Lord Jesus, that you paid for our sins perfectly. You are the great atonement. You're the sacrifice that every sacrifice was looking forward to. God, in you, we have all that we need. We shall not want. We look to other places for our strength, the approval of others, our pocketbooks, our bank accounts, all these things, but in you we shall not want. So, Lord, we bring to you our tithes and offerings, and we pray, Lord, that they would be just a picture of our whole being that belongs to you. Everything belongs to you. We pray that you would take our offerings and use them for your glory and for the good of this world, for the blessing of your gospel in this place and beyond. That the knowledge of our Lord Jesus would cover this earth as the waters cover the sea. In his name we pray. Amen. You stand and we'll sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. come to the table of the Lord, and here we celebrate that it is Jesus 
who fulfilled this deep longing to restore us to God, to deal with our sin perfectly. And that he did, did it perfectly. With his work on the cross, he cried out, it is finished, completed, perfectly accomplished. So we celebrate here that this is what God does for us in Jesus. Our sins are gone, right? Psalm 103 that we heard. As far as the east is from the west, gone, gone. This is what we celebrate. That if you are in Christ, you have been made a new creation. You're with God. Your sins are completely gone. So this is the Eucharist table. This is a Thanksgiving table. This is the Thanksgiving meal that we all long for right here. This is Thanksgiving. So if you know Jesus, if you've been baptized and belong to his church and confess the faith of Christ, then this table's for you. I want to invite you to come, take, and eat. In your weariness, in the long journey, come, take. Jesus wants to feed you and to sustain you. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't confess that it's his work alone on the cross that saves you, then don't take. That would be totally inauthentic to who you are. But let, let, let these elements pass you by. I, I will tell you this, that we aren't taking from the common cup and the common loaf together right now, so we'll distribute it to you, and then when you have the elements, please keep them until we can eat together, still symbolizing our unity in Christ around this uh, sacrament. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give, give thanks and praise. It is, it is our privilege and our joy to give you thanks and praise, Lord God, because you create all things in order to dwell in covenant love with your people. When the covenant was broken, you promised to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, in which you would put your law within them and write it on their hearts. You would be their God, and they would be your people. They would all know you from the least of them to the greatest, for you would forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. In the body and blood of Jesus, you made that new covenant, and in his death and resurrection, we are bound to you and you to us forevermore. And so we join with the company of heaven and sing of your everlasting glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to our Lord. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that he took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after the supper, the Lord took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul adds that it is as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Lord Jesus, we think of the long exile of your people in Babylon, and we who have been brought near to you through the blood of Christ still feel the angst of exile in this life, Lord. We have tasted of the things of heaven. We are tasting them in this meal. Just an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But God, how we long for you to return, to make things right perfectly, for us to dwell with you perfectly, for sin to be no more, for disease to be no more. How creation itself is longing for this, for the sons of God to be revealed in glory, as Romans 8 says. God, this is our longing. And yet, Lord, we're so delighted and grateful that as you wait, you give us the gift of the Spirit that the Spirit has descended on the church, that the Spirit is with us even now, giving us faith and life. Spirit, be with us as we take these elements, uh, sanctify them for us. 
Lord, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would be the body of Christ, redeemed by the blood of Christ and sent out in his name. We pray this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. You may be seated. Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending He, of the things that are that have. future year shall see evermore and evermore oh that birth forever blessed when the virgin full of grace by the Holy Ghost conceiving, bore the Savior of our race, and the babe the world's Redeemer, first revealed his sacred face. Evermore and evermore. This is he whom had taught singers, sang of old with one accord, whom the scriptures of the prophets promised in their faithful word. Now he shines the long expected. Let creation praise its Lord evermore and evermore. Heights of heaven adore him. Angel hosts his praises sing. All dominions bow before him and extol our God and King. Let no tongue on earth be silent, every voice in concert ring, evermore and evermore. Christ to thee with God the Father, and O Holy Ghost to thee, hymn and chant and high thanksgiving, and unwearied praises be, honor, glory, and
Jesus' body was broken for you and your sins were atoned for. Take and eat. The blood of Christ was shed for you and you are washed white as snow. Take and drink. Our great God, we bless you and we praise you. We thank you that you have completed the work perfectly on Calvary. Lord Jesus, you took on flesh and you walked this earth for us. You walked to the cross for us. You died for us. You rose again to new life. And you will return. We bless you and we praise you. And we pray that this week, having tasted of these things of heaven, you would send us out with your grace to be agents of your mercy in this world. Pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand and receive this benediction, this blessing from God to you this morning. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. We're going to do some singing again together. So grab your worship guides. We are not overcome. will fail and bones will break thieves will steal the earth will shake night will fall the light will fade the Lord will give and take away because of
have no fear for your life turn your cheek turn Brothers and sisters, go in peace uh, with thanksgiving, especially thinking this week, to love and serve the Lord. Peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Amen. Thanks. But justice cried with frowning face, this mountain is no
Justice cried with frowning face This mountain is no hiding place Then a great heavenly voice I heard And mercy's angel form appeared She led me on with pallid face To Jesus
It's my 